Foot Clan football is back. And that means yes. your fantasy draft is back. It is quickly approaching. You got to get ready. The ultimate draft kit. You can grab it right now. We're updating this thing all off season. 100 plus player profiles, our full projections, sleepers, breakouts, busts. It's a good time. Look, it's a big party. Always <laughs> happening in the ultimate draft kit. Comes with a free app. Look, you just, just head over there real quick. UltimateDraftKit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Fantasy Footballers Podcast. So excited to be with you. The foot, the foot clan. That's what I was going to say. Mm. That's that's not the right phrase. The foot clan has got to be excited right now because some football is going to happen. <laughs> we're just going to keep going with it. I don't know. We we're, we're recording this show on Friday, just uh, minutes after. Some big time news about the NFL and the NFL PA. And we're hyped. We're excited. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on. And thankfully, it looks like football is going to happen. Yeah. You know, I've been watching videos of all of the, the teams and how they've set things up. I mean, it, it's just to me, it's it's a done deal. It's here. I'm super ready. Next week, training camps start. I am I am beyond excited. And uh, this today's show is awesome because, you know, a lot of the, I love the divisional pre- previews. I think they're one of my favorite shows of the year, but not every division is fun to talk about from team <laughs> one to team four. You know, the end of some of these shows when we're going through, you know, the order of wins last year, you're like, oh, we got to talk about this irrelevant team. But today, I mean, every team Ooh, is fantasy hot. hotness. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Mike, you doing well? Oh, I'm doing uh, as well as could be, my friend. Yeah, we're talking NFC South on the show today. You heard Mike at the top remind you about the Ultimate Draft Kit. Bunch of ranking adjustments in there today. We'll catch you up on what's going on with the NFL PA and the players and the opt-out situation, but you could have a lot of drama for fantasy football rankings and the way drafts are going to look in the next 10 days because some players may opt out of the season. And that's happened in every major sports league that has resumed playing, and so I expect it to happen here. Whether a medical designation or whether just uh, a player evaluating their own risk or the family exposure, it's going to happen. So Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be another wrinkle. I mean, as fantasy football players, that's kind of half of what we do is react, right, to to injury news or to roster news and depth charts. And, I mean, it's just another piece of the puzzle for 2020, but I'm excited that we get the chance to do that. Yeah, and, and the beautiful part is for everybody playing fantasy and worrying about, oh, what if this player doesn't play? The nice thing is we don't have to necessarily react when it comes to these things. There's a 10-day window, so we're going to be able to uh, – or we don't have to project. We can react. We can actually look at what happens – make our adjustments before fantasy drafts, and it, it's going to be an awesome season. A reminder to everybody out there, if you're looking for a great league to be a part of, we facilitate that each and every year. So if you have struggled to find other dedicated owners for your league, uh, you can go to footclanleagues.com. Uh, if you're a member of the Foot Clan, there's 7,500 plus of you out there looking for leagues, dynasty, keeper, auction, local, online, whatever the case may be. It's a great time to get involved right now because we're going to have football. And, and don't, f- don't forget about like literally the best league, the largest league in the world, that if they're at Join the Foot, they have access to the the Megala Bowl. Oh, it's going to be bigger than ever this year. We're, we're not signing people up yet, but it's a little teaser. Just if wait. we were signing people up, oh. you wouldn't have just – Settled for a slight growl. No. You would have much, gone into a much more ferocious. Much more megaly. <laughs> Mega. Man. 
Uh, we appreciate everybody supporting the podcast. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Maybe you're ad-free on Stitcher Premium. We appreciate you listening in. One small announcement before we get to the quick question, and that is that we are looking for... Now, it's two, right, Jason? Is that what we're looking at? Well, we don't, we don't put ourselves writers. into a box. We will stay water. But yes, this is a... This <laughs> Never is put a, us in a box. How dare you, you? You say it's a little announcement, but I know I get hit up all the time. When are you guys looking to add writers? Well, this is our announcement. Right now, we are looking to add a couple of qualified writers uh, to the team uh, to bring in, to become part of the Fantasy Footballers organization, write some articles. Uh, we're looking for people who can find things that help the Foot Clan win championships um, and who know the show. I mean, that's why we're announcing it here. We're not posting it on social media. We want people who know the Foot Clan to help the Foot Clan. It is very exciting. And, you know, not to uh, put too much pressure on the applicants out there. By the way, you can go to footclanhelp.com to apply to be a writer uh, with the fantasy footballers. But it is a tight knit uh, group, and we are very particular about those selections and getting the right people on board that are going to bring value to those that browse the website. And uh, ultimately, that informs the show too, because a lot of the research that our writers uh, work on, you know, we're taking some of that information into the podcast and then and taking it, credit for it and taking credit. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for finishing. Are you that. smarter than us? Make us better at FootClanHelp.com. <laughs> All right, quick question of the day before we get into the news and the divisional breakdowns. This one comes in from a Foot Clan supporter. He says, do you let draft picks in one league influence your picks in other leagues? For example, do you avoid having the same players in multiple leagues so an injury slash bust doesn't hurt you across all of your leagues? So it's a good question. What do you think? I mean, this is a matter when it comes to my main leagues, right? I think when we first started doing this podcast a long time ago, and we got into a bunch of leagues, uh, maybe this applied a little bit more. And then we, we dialed it back. I wanted to make sure that the leagues I'm in, I care about. We've got three or four major leagues we're in, and then a couple that we do together. And in those leagues, because I really care about them, I am not trying to diversify my portfolio. I'm going after the <laughs> players I like. If I like Hollywood Brown, I'm going to draft him whenever he's a value. I'm not going to sit there on the, you know, when I'm on the clock and be like, well, I've already got one share, so I'll pivot somewhere else. <laughs> now, if you're I, doing <laughs> DFS or best ball in mass, you know, if you're ta if, if yeah, you're doing a hundred best ball leagues, that's where you're taking this more as I mean, a portfolio. This is, it's just it, it's a look into the psyche of the fantasy player, though, because this is like. I'm asking myself the question with AJ Green. I think the value's there as an eighth round pick. It's like, do you want to find one chest full of gold or three chests full of gold? Like, I, I think fantasy players are just greedy about their picks. I mean, I'm greedy about the guys I like. I would rather make three victory laps, not just one. Maybe yeah, this I'd is just has to do with how confident we are. <laughs> because, like, if you're not sure, if you're like, you know, you look at that and you say, do I want three? Chest of gold. When I hear AJ Green, I think like, oh, <laughs> do you do you want three empty chests? And so, <laughs> if you're not confident in your own takes or the players you love, then maybe yeah. that's where you diversify so that you you know you win some and you lose some. I'll have players every year that are must draft players in all my leagues if I if if I can help it. But then I I do like grabbing other players more so because I want. Like I want to expand the fun of the players that I'm rooting for on a weekly basis, and that's why I we like we try to keep the leagues smaller so I don't have the situation where everything is good and everything is terrible at the exact same time. <laughs> but I still want more players that like I'm happy that they scored a touchdown, more skin in the game. I know for a fact, Mike will have Antonio Gibson in every league. Like something like that yes. is such a low cost investment late in a draft that that's not going to hurt you necessarily. Uh, maybe not as late in drafts as Mike would like if he keeps he, talking about well, no, it. He, he, the league he plays of in too many, too many leagues. He plays in too many leagues with us, Andy. <laughs> He's not getting Antonio Gibson in our <laughs> leagues. It, yeah, I don't know what I'm more addicted to, having great players on my roster or hearing Mike scream in pain when I take one of the in players the he likes. Yeah. Oh, that look, that feels good. That's, <laughs> that's fuel. I don't care who you are, that feels yeah. good. 
<laughs> All right, let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. All right, the big news is what we, we said at the top. The uh, NFLPA, their executives, as of this recording, have unanimously recommended the latest CBA proposal made by the NFL. The, the players still have to technically vote, but when, a, you know, when the executive committee unanimously recommends it, mm-hmm. there is a, uh, expe- there's an expectation pretty, that this is going to happen. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So that would mean training camp opens as scheduled on Tuesday. Uh, there are a few, I guess, caveats to this deal worth bringing up. What do you guys think the kind of headline is? The, the opt-out designation? Yeah, situation? I would say the headline for me is the opt-out, which they've said it's 10 days, or I've also seen August 3rd posted. So, like, I mean, I wasn't sure when the 10 days started, so but I have seen the date, August 3rd, uh, as the, the opt-out. You kind of alluded to it, Andy. There's going to be, as far as we know right now, two tiers that you can opt out. One, the player themselves, if they have a medical condition that puts them at risk if they were to contract uh, COVID, so they can opt out and they're going to get some type of stipend. We don't have the information what that is yet. And then the players who just, they want out because they, they it, no things questions aren't sitting asked. well with them. Yeah. They're not feeling safe. What Whatever the, 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 the reason is, a player may opt out and they'll be at a different stipend. But that's, that's the big one because you are right that someone's going to opt out that we are not expecting. There will be some top-tier NFL players who opt, opt out. I haven't heard uh, I don't, many big names. I think Demarcus Lawrence was the largest name that I've heard floated as a possible opt-out. But other than that, I, I don't know who they're going to be yet. Just sharing my opinion, I don't think there'll be a lot. I really don't. Yeah, think, it, but there'll be a I few. I think there'll be a few. Yeah. yeah. The NFL, the careers, the the time period uh that players have to play, I, I think there'll be few. You get a few years in the NFL, unless you're Tom Brady and then you play yeah, for two you, decades. Yeah. But uh yeah, I mean I, I think most players will will play. And then the, the the other big headlining piece to me is that twenty twenty will be agreed upon that it's a no play, no pay. So if games were to get canceled, the players would not get money. What that means to me is that it is going to take a lot to get any games canceled. I mean, they're, they're playing a season this year. I am stoked about it. And then uh, there was some information just about when you're looking at insuring some of your top-tier running backs, one name that has not come up has been whoever would back up Todd Gurley in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Uh, There was a quote about Brian Hill that some players in the Atlanta organization thought that Brian Hill should have had an opportunity to be the lead back in Atlanta. That's uh, good information for fantasy owners that are looking to ensure the Todd, like independent of a COVID season where Todd Gilly has come out. It it was before these agreements took place. So I don't put too much into what he said, but he said, look, that at the time he wasn't feeling great about the safety plan and he was prepared for the situation where he might have to sit out. He's an injury risk. And here you have a situation on a good offense that you could say, who's the guy behind him? Is it Ito Smith? Is it Quadre Olson? And maybe it is Brian Hill, in fact. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was excited to see this quote. When we were in the Scotty Fish Bowl, I know Mike was bringing uh, Brian Hill's name up late, yeah. but I was worried because there's Ito Smith and Quadre Olson. I, I think Brian Hill is the most talented of the three, that's who I. If I was the coach, I would give him the shot. But it seemed like last year the next man it, up was Ito, which made no sense. Who, so, who is didn't now we hurt? Have a, didn't we have a Brian Hill week? Like we did have. A, oh, we absolutely did. Where yeah. it was he was the waiver pickup, and then yeah, he him came and Mike. And it was him and Mike Boone went out for some froyo after they let every fantasy owner down. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, I mean. I feel like you had those two, and then uh, who was the running back in Detroit? I know that they rotated through a few, but... What, Scarborough? No, the other Johnson. Oh. Who, who was before? Because there oh, was Ty, Ty Johnson. Ty Johnson, Ty Johnson. Yes. there you go. Yeah, that he, he's in that group of, oh, no. Like, the, the, the waiver wire money was spent, <laughs> and you got jack squat. All right, uh, here's some other news. We've been following the Dalvin Cook situation. This is... You know, we don't know for certain right now, but um, ESPN is reporting that they do not expect Dalvin Cook's holdout to last beyond the first week of training camp. 
It's based on the new CBA, which mandates a $50,000 fine per day for a player that does not report. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's, 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 no, that's not, you know, oh, 5000 50000 a day. You miss a week, and that's that's a quarter million dollars. You're you're not wanting to hold out if your goal is more money. And so I, I was pretty feeling pretty positive about Cook in general, but they could come to an agreement, or he could just show up. Um, and then we did have uh, some news that Tua is feeling Ooh. feeling all right, ready to go, according to an interview with USA Today. Does that news matter to you? Hearing it from Tua himself. Not at all. I mean, it's one of those things where uh, doesn't I, I, matter to me either. Why? They're the three most difficult. We're here positions. to give the news. Yeah, the three most difficult positions for rookies are quarterback, offensive line, and tight end. Those just have so much to learn, and the fact that he's coming off of the injury, he's coming off, and doesn't have that expectation the way Burrow does to be a Week One starter. I think it would just be insane to throw a rookie quarterback with this shortened uh camp experience out on the field week one so i'm not worried about him saying my health is good normally ryan fitzpatrick goes with the route of he throws that rookie out there after That's a couple exactly of weeks right. of of performances that you're like wait maybe he's just like a real generous dude what if it comes yeah. out after his career is like oh yeah but i wanted to to get in so that's why i threw five picks he would do that he would. He's yeah. a nice guy. Him and Josh McCown would do that. All right. We're going to get into the divisional breakdowns. Before we do, I want to thank today's sponsor, WGU. You won't stop working until you reach your goals, and neither will WGU. That's why they've created an online university for people whose ambition never rests. WGU's innovative competency-based learning model was designed specifically to fit the lives of busy adults. They're a nonprofit offering online bachelor's and master's degrees in business, IT, education, and nursing. And you can move through the material you already know, spend time learning what you don't, which means uh, you know the faster you demonstrate what you know, the faster you finish their programs. It's about half the cost of most other online universities, so you can graduate with far less debt or none at all. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash fantasyfootballers. That's wgu.edu slash fantasy footballers. And Foot Clan, we want to make sure that you are prepped for this season. And the Ultimate Draft Kit is the place to be prepped. And look, I, I know a lot of people listening right now, they already have the Ultimate Draft Kit. They're ready to go. But there are some new features coming out to our website. These new player profiles we're about to launch are awesome, and you will get special access to things on that with Ultimate Draft Kit. It's just included. We're just including it with that. This season is going to be different than ever. You are going to want the information from the Ultimate Draft Kit this year more than ever. So check it out at ultimatedraftkit.com if you want all of our stats, all of our blurbs, all of our projections, video profile breakdowns, everything you need for 2020 get you through this crazy year at ultimatedraftkit.com. Let's get divisional. All right. We are continuing our divisional breakdowns, the fantasy football questions, answers for each and every team. And we're in the NFC South today, beginning with the New Orleans Saints last year, 13 and three. They've gone seven and one on the road in back to back seasons. Pretty impressive. I think. You know, any NFL fan out there looks at the Saints as that team right on the edge of, you know, Super Bowl contention in the last several years. Yeah, they just had a Vikings problem. Yeah, yeah, they did. And uh, what did we have the one year? I'm sorry, Saints will change the rules so you can throw a, a challenge flag on pass interference. Oh, no, that was terrible. We'll take it back. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the, the, but the nice thing is the Saints as an organization have a lot of continuity. Offense and defense, they are returning the core of this team. And in this type of an offseason, when you have a veteran team led by the same head coach for a long time, same quarterback, all the main pieces are there. I think it gives the Saints a huge leg up on a lot of the league. I'm, I, this, is, this is the make-or-break year for Super Bowl for the Saints. 
Yeah, I mean, we we talked about the Kansas City Chiefs and that continuity. It feels like the Saints are that NFC roster that that is together. Uh, they have, you know, that element of quarterback, head coach, offensive coordinator. You don't have something new you're learning. Obviously, Drew Brees, one of the best in the game. The big addition this offseason was Emmanuel Sanders, wide receiver, coming over to New Orleans from San Francisco. No more Ted Ginn. Teddy Bridgewater is now the, the quarterback in Carolina. But when you look at Emmanuel Sanders, let's start there. Uh, we've talked about him at times. I really like what he brings to Drew Brees more than you know my attitude at, at, at I have to have Emmanuel Sanders on my roster. I think there's obviously a price that I'd like to pay for him, but it's late in drafts. Right now he's the wide receiver 41 off the board. How do you guys feel about what he brings to this uh, offense? I really like Sanders. I think that he still has it, which to me was, you know, a bit of a miracle for him to come off of that injury. Meanwhile, his, you know, his teammate, former teammate Demarius Thomas, same injury, is out of the league now. So he's he still has it. And I took a look back because we're all, well, I think we're all a bit jaded right now. One, the the passing volume for the Saints over the past couple of years has been coming down, but the last two years, it's been Traquan Smith as really the wide receiver too and he has let people down in a pretty big way you know including I, th I think the Saints organization he's not the player that they hoped he would become and if you look at the past 11 seasons even including the Traquan Smith past two years uh, the wide receiver too for Drew Brees and the Saints he's been a top 30 fantasy wide receiver in eight of 11 years but not the last two because Traquan Smith has been that guy so I think there is, uh, there. We, I think we should like Emmanuel Sanders a little bit more than we do. Yeah, I mean the top thirty number tells you that if, if that came to fruition, obviously Sanders is well below that in draft capital. Traquan Smith felt more like the wide receiver two by result, not by design. You know, a piece of the puzzle beyond Michael Thomas, but Michael Thomas dominated so much of that offense. I think one of the other big question marks about this team is what Alvin Kamara are you going to get? Right. This season, he's the RB4 off the board. So I think the consensus is that he'll be back and be one of the most effective fantasy running backs in football. You guys both feel that way? Do you do you feel like there'll be a return to the touchdown totals, at least in part from a couple of years ago? Because, you know, last year was a struggle. I absolutely think Alvin Kamara is going to be a, a, a tip top back. I mean, that's someone that when you take at the fourth spot in the draft, it's ironic because really when you're at that fourth or fifth spot, the two players that you're usually deciding on are teammates here between Alvin Kamara and Michael Thomas in yeah. your first round saying, do I want that running back or wide receiver? I would go with Alvin Kamara because I, I like the running back as a tiebreaker and the truth is, Alvin Kamara's been great. This offense is great. They have no new competition against him. And last season, he was dominating. He didn't get as many touchdowns early in the season. And then he got injured with the same injury that Saquon Barkley had. It took time to get back. But I remember the first couple games of last year just watching how dominant he is. He gets to the edge. He makes people miss. I see no reason on film or with any transaction that the team has made to say that Alvin Kamara wouldn't be a top option. And I'm glad we get to talk about him today because he's he's really been – there's always the top three, right? You're right. always talking about Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, and Zeke. And then we're talking about the back of the first. We're talking, do you go Josh Jacobs or Dalvin Cook if he slips or Kenya Drake? But Alvin Kamara is sitting here, and 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 probably Derrick Henry is, is near here as well, where you're saying – he just doesn't get a lot of press right now, but he's still being drafted there, and I fully I, expect him to have a great great season. I think the one thing that Alvin Kamara has that is different than those top three guys is that a little bit of insecurity about what you're going to get around the goal line because Latavius Murray was pretty good last year. Alvin Kamara went from 34 10 zone rushes to 14 in a span of uh, 2018 to 2019. Yes, there was some injury concerns, and yes, you're going to get the receiving totals from Kamara. But I do want, you know, when you look at what the top 10 backs bring you, Kamara does bring a question mark as to whether he gets that work. And that's just something you have to a accept with what he brings. A, a little bit. I, I took a, I was looking at those numbers too, Andy, and where 
Uh, Kamara's big year in 2018, he had 13 carries inside the five, like the really, really valuable carries. He had 13 of them. Mark Ingram had 12 that year. So, like, they, they, that's crap, though. You got 25 carries. Last year, Kamara only had eight. Now he was injured. So, I mean, if he doesn't miss a few, miss those games, perhaps he's right back up to the 13. But what's wild to me is Latavius Murray had four. That would. That's it. So between the two starting running backs, you only had 12 carries inside the five compared to 25 two years ago. It was, and I mean, I was look, trying to look at this from every single angle I could find. You know, Drew Brees, his red zone attempts were very, very close, uh, at least what he was pacing last year, you know, 2019 to 2018. The Saints offense was only six yards a game better in 2018. They just... They just didn't score as many points, and I think that that's just one of those ebbs I like, and flows of the NFL. So I, re I really, really like Kamara where he's going in the draft. It, it is, uh, it's difficult for me to shake that quote from last offseason. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, which yeah. was gotcha. Sean Payton talking about Alvin Kamara being soft. It was not you know on record anywhere, but that quote combined with Latavius Murray being brought in and then Kamara – following that quote up with getting hurt. And so that component of, of whether he can stay healthy to me is still a variable in his projections. I am the lowest of the three of us. So that's why I bring up at least a wart in my mind. I've met RB seven. So, Oh wow. I'm, you know, severely really disrespecting him. him. I hate him. Uh, yeah, he but, did, he did, you know, it's, it's one of those things because the touchdowns did come and the injury happened. I don't think you realize how good he was last season you know, 18 touches per game, and that's including the games where he got injured, including week 17, where I think he was like 40% snap share. 18 touches a game for a guy that's as efficient as Alvin Kamara is is going to be great. Now, I know we like to look, and, and maybe we're going to stay on the Saints longer than I thought, but I know we like to look at rebounds and the fact that they were, you know, number one in rushing touchdowns for two consecutive years before dropping to 20 last year. And like some of these numbers are going to return to the norm. But I know when we've talked about the Chiefs, you guys have been quick to bring up the defense. And the defense in New Orleans is stout. It is good. That was something that took a huge step forward last year. Fourth in the league in defensive rushing yards per game given up. It, it's one of those things where... Because you had to throw on them. Well, because, yeah, you had to throw on them. But I'm saying if their defense is top-notch, is, is the reason for some of those numbers coming down last year less about just ebbs and flows and more about the defense. No, because the it wasn't total offensive numbers. It was a shift from running to passing. It was Drew Brees throwing for 7% touchdown rate and and Michael Thomas getting every single ball that's ever been thrown uh caught. Um, yeah, he, so I, he caught the most passes he in a single season. He stole 35 history. of Alvin Kamara's receptions from him. <laughs> right. He just took so the ball out of his hands. I don't I don't think this is the, you know we were we were talking about this on the last episode I brought up the fact that the Saints still want to they want to score 40 points every game, even with their great defense. They're not trying to slow the game down and win a defensive and, you know, running game. That's why Alvin Kamara is not going to get 300 touches on the ground. He's going to be closer to 200, but they will air it out. And I think, you know, we've, we've said this before. This is the only narrative street thing here for the, for the saints, but breeze wants some records and he's close to some records and Alvin Kamara in the passing game is going to help him get there. Jared Kuk. Jared Kuk. Averaged 4.6 targets per game last year. Led all tight ends in yards per reception at 16.4. That's kind of a Jared Cook thing to do. 21% mm -hmm. uh, of his receptions were touchdowns. Talk about the efficiency of Drew Brees when he went to Jared Kuk. I'm sure, I'm sure that'll happen again. Yeah. Oh, it could. It really could. I mean, when when you have a, an offense like this and a hyper efficient quarterback that picks his spots, it could, it could happen. I mean, it, Cook is a big play tight end. That's one of those prerequisites that I like for for my tight end position is not just looking at the two yard reception around the goal line, but the seam route that Breeze has been able to dominate with with his tight end for his entire career. I I like that that possibility where where you can have a guy catch two long bomb touchdown passes at tight end on his only two targets. So I think the question mark is you're probably sacrificing some volume with Cook, but the, the touchdowns could easily be there again. They, yeah, they could be there, but I 
I'm out. I've dis- discussed how I, I'm not really drafting Jared Cook. I'm not paying that middle round for him because I. Th- it's that the, the the platform that he's standing on a fantasy value. That thing is just barely balanced. Where if if the wind blows a direction, like he's going to be brutal for your fantasy team. So I'm I'm just not paying up. And then with the addition of of an actual good wide receiver too for the team, it could be trouble for Cook. I I do think his volume will be low, and that's what you're saying, Mike. It's it's a little bit scary to have someone that is so touchdown dependent. But the reality is almost every tight end that you're going to draft outside of, you know, the the top three or four guys are pretty much touchdown dependent. So I sure. am going to take the one who has Drew Brees, has a great offense, has a history of and scoring did it touchdowns last year. and did it last year. But I, to- I mean, you're, you're right. He is not a week in, week out. You plug it in your lineup, and you're just happy with your tight end every week. He's going to have his up ga- up games. He's going to have his down games. And uh, but I'm I'm fine with him. And and the nice thing is he's not really a middle round tight end. He's actually in the drafts that I've been in. I don't I don't know what his ADP is, but I've ended up drafting him several times around the the ninth round. And I'm I've happy had, to interesting. I've had him and Brees uh, that combination like yeah. you're talking about ninth tenth round managing to get both guys. Let's talk about the Atlanta Falcons. Last year, seven and nine. It was a rough start. We didn't know if Dan Quinn would make it through the season. Uh, somehow, <laughs> somehow he did. They went what one and seven before the bye week. That's correct. But went six and two in the second half. Had road wins against New Orleans and San Francisco. Turned it around to the point where Dan Quinn is still the head coach of this franchise. And uh, you know, it's a good offense, passing yards per game. You know, you know, he's Matt Ryan's going to air it out. Yes. Uh, 294 passing yards per game, 29 touchdowns. When you look at this upcoming season, what are the big question marks for you guys around Atlanta's offense and projecting? You know, you don't have to say much about players like Julio Jones, but he's I good, know, which is, you know, he's a good player. Yeah. Right. Still struggles with the touchdown totals on a consistent basis. And in part, that's because Matt Ryan struggles with throwing the football in the red zone. You look at Sharp uh, analytics this past year, 29th in red zone passing efficiency. Mm. I mean, he just, yeah. time and time again, he, he finds a way to throw interceptions in the end he, zone. He will throw the yards, though. I mean, the, yeah. you know, over 4,000 yard yards. Throw it. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, he's always over 4,000 yards. He's closer now to 5,000 yards than 4,000 over, you know, most of the last few years. So the passing offense is going to work. I think the three questions are Todd Gurley, Calvin Ridley, and Hayden Hurst. Can they go, you know, they've got the range of outcome where they can all be really good fantasy options. I don't expect this defense to be good. They're in a division that's going to score the ball a lot. Their schedule is bad, which could be good for the offense actually having to, uh, you know, score more points. If you want to win, it's going to be on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, so, you know, let's start with Calvin Ridley. He's someone right. that at the beginning of the off season, I had him in my top 12. I saw the breakout coming. I, you know, and, and since then I've, I've cooled a little bit. I went deeper into the splits when Hayden Hurst, or I'm sorry, when, uh, Hooper was out. And that's really when Ridley took advantage. And while good thing Hayden, they got rid of Hooper then, huh? Yeah, but Hayden Hurst is coming <laughs> in. It's very different when you've got a guy that gets uh, injured and there isn't a replacement versus Hurst is not going to fill the entirety of Hooper's shoes, but they're planning on him being on the field, having, you know, targets. This is a team that has thrown the ball to the tight end a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, I see Calvin Ridley. Decent breakout, but more like wide receiver 16, uh, wide receiver 2. Wide receiver Ridley. 16 is where he's being drafted, for what it's worth. 63 for 866 and 7 last year, only played 13 games. And he's tough because before the the Muhammad Sanu trade, he was about 53 yards a game. And then, you know, six receptions, 82 yards a game for the next six games before he went down with his own injury. But you're right, Jay, the Austin Hooper injury – and a couple games where it took Hooper uh, to reestablish himself in the offense, those also coincided uh, with the Calvin Ridley breakout. So it's it's tough to know what to believe about Calvin Ridley, like w- which side will happen. But 
they're like the the Falcons in between Tony Gonzalez and Austin Hooper. We actually have a four year gap of Atlanta really struggling to use the tight end position. You had the Toy Lolo uh, years. Yeah, the Toy Lolo years, the Jacob Tammy years, and then Austin Hooper's first two years in the league. Yes, it 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 was really nothing. So Ken Hayden Hurst, he's got the draft capital. I mean he he should be able to handle that. But there's still a very large question of can he handle that? It's another well, situation of a, this is a, a player changing teams, which is not necessarily the best thing as we've seen in the past. So I still believe more in the Calvin Ridley breakout than him not. Yeah, I, I side that direction too. Although, um, yeah, I, I think Hurst will be involved. Mohamed Sanu, Sanu is obviously gone. Russell Gage never gets talked about despite the fact he – this is shocking. He actually led the Falcons wide receivers in red zone targets last year. <laughs> That's because the yeah, red zone maybe targets you should stop don't, throwing at Russell Gage. <laughs> red zone targets don't mean a lot coming from Atlanta. If I were Julio Jones, uh, I would cut that stat out and paste it on Matt Ryan's <laughs> locker. I would walk yeah, over and say, is, Look look what I just found. If this ever wrong. happens again, I'm gonna slap you. Well, he's going to get slapped because it's it's happened for a decade. I'm sure it's going to continue to happen. All right. And as we move over to Todd Gurley, guys, I have prepared a, a fun little short oh, game. Oh, dear goodness. Do, 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 do. I don't think Todd, I'm going to like this game. Ready? Mike. This yes. game is called Todd Gurley or David Montgomery. Are you <laughs> ready for this game? Oh, I'm not ready. I'm excited about this game. All right, fellas. Your first question. Last year, who had more rushing attempts, David Montgomery or Todd Gurley? Todd Gurley. Yeah, I'll go with Gurley. The answer is David Montgomery with 242 to 223. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, Hopefully. Having, having said that, who had more rushing yards, David Montgomery or Todd Gurley? David Montgomery. Oh, man, it must be. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't David Montgomery. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. The answer is David Montgomery with 889 <laughs> rushing yards. Uh, we got to keep it going, though. Who had more receptions, Todd Gurley oh. or David Montgomery? That one actually is easiest. David dee, Montgomery, dee, they didn't dee, use Todd Gurley in the dee, passing game dee, last year. Dee, 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 that sounds dee, stupid. Dee. It was Todd Gurley. I had to throw you off the scent of the game. No way. <laughs> what? They barely Todd, passed the ball. Todd Gurley had 31 receptions. Monty had... 25. All right. Those high value carries. More carries inside the five yard line. Who had more? David Montgomery or Todd Gurley? I feel like I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going Gurley. I'll go with Monty. The answer is David Montgomery, who had 18. He had the third most at the position. I don't All right, like well, we only game. got two more questions, fellas. Oh, I'm, great. I haven't been keeping track. Ask who had think, more touchdowns. I know. I that don't one. even like participating because I just want to be on Mike's side. <laughs> who had more yards from scrimmage? Yards from scrimmage. Just overall total yards. David Montgomery or Todd Gurley? David Montgomery. <laughs> the answer yep. is David Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, it's only 10. He only had 10 more yards from scrimmage than Todd Gurley. And here is the whole point of me bringing this up. Who had more Can, fantasy points? David Todd Montgomery. Gurley. Todd Gurley oh, had for nearly, touchdowns, touchdowns. nearly 50 more points. So my point in bringing this up, think about how you felt about David Montgomery's production last year. He was outproducing Todd Gurley in yardage and carries and a, like barely behind him in receptions. Todd Gurley's entire season was built on the back of rushing touchdowns, and now he is changing teams. Is that going to happen? I I think not. And if, I, if the rushing touchdowns go away for Todd Gurley, you're going to feel real bad you drafted him in the fourth round. Can I add one more question? Yes. Uh, who do I have ranked higher in my running back <laughs> rankings? David Montgomery or Todd Gurley? <laughs> yes. It's, oh, this... If it's David Montgomery, that that has to just feel like you're just It's David Montgomery. That you is were correct. the Todd Gurley guy. Like you called for the resurgence of Todd Gurley. So are you speaking to Jason? I'm talking, no, I'm talking to you, Andy. You, like the year when, where Yeah. 
Like when, we're when talking he about, came back to life, you oh, were all. It hurt, you're saying it hurts me because yes. of the year when he came back to life. Yes, after yes. Jeff Fisher. Yeah, that was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, dear Mike. Yes. Here is why I got the question wrong on receptions. Because Todd Gurley only had 31 receptions. And the two years prior, 64 and 59. Would you say that Todd Gurley is a very good receiving back? Yes. What's wild about this, Jason, I don't know if you have this stat in front of you. Todd Gurley was tied for the fourth most routes run at the running back position. He had 391 routes. That's he tied with Le'Veon Bell. Lev Bell had 66 receptions. Like, what happened? I don't Why know. were they not throwing the ball to Gurley? Is there something we don't know? It was it was super weird. Or I would, don't. Or were they think, dumb? I don't know. I don't think that that that's the question this year, right? You're you you've got Devonta Freeman, who has always been a pass catching running back, who has exited. He was even less efficient than Todd Gurley was this last year. He was putrid. Um, and so now Todd Gurley comes in. If he's better than Devonta Freeman on the ground and actually has the passing work, does that make up for the lack of touchdowns? I believe it does because there, you know, there's no team in the entire NFL with more vacated targets. Vacated targets tend to go to the running back position. You have a running back who can catch the ball, a sure. quarterback who passes to the running back. So while I don't think he's going to be a touchdown machine for Atlanta, I do think his passing work comes up. I am fine drafting Todd Gurley this year, but apparently at, at where, where he's being drafted, apparently I am on an island. Well, I, I just think that there's not going to be just Todd Gurley on the field. I've said that for the last two months. I don't think that they're going to bring Todd Gurley in and give him every down. I think you're going to be disappointed in Atlanta with the rotation. And Gurley will be on the field, Very no possible. doubt, but I'm worried about the rotation there. And, uh, you know, I think you, the, if you threw in front of your statement the, what Atlanta does with Devonta Freeman, you know, if, if Gurley gets the majority of the running back work, I don't see any reason why he shouldn't be productive and outperform where I have him in ranked and uh, where I expect him to be. I just don't have the confidence that that's what they brought him in to do. And it's, because it's Dan tough. Quinn has used – he has befuddled us with his rotations in the right. past. So, and, and just speaking to the draft and like in best ball ADP, like Todd Gurley right now is sandwiched between Leonard Fournette, Melvin Gordon, Lev Bell, Chris Carson. You know, the – not that I love all of those players, but I definitely would rather have Chris Carson on my team. I'd rather have Le'Veon Bell on my team. I'd rather have Fournette. So I just I don't know if there will be a team where I draft Todd Gurley. All right, let's talk about the tam – do you have Melvin Gordon higher than Gurley, Jason? I do have Melvin Gordon higher than Gurley. I know you like Gordon. I was curious how close they were. Tampa Bay, last year 7-9. and nine. They had a bunch of one-score games. We talked about that on the previous show with the NFC North. Um, they were three and six in those one-score games. I think that was those are the kind of games that uh, Bruce yeah, Arians probably, turns into a, a tomato. Um, I think we know whose fault it was. <laughs> without question. Uh, Jameis Winston, oh. think about this number in your head. He threw an interception on 7.3% of his attempts. Holy crap. So you were just waiting for the next one to land, and that's why he's not a starting quarterback despite throwing oh. for 5,000 yards Man. and Tampa being the number one team in football in passing yards per game. Uh, it, it's a testament to Bruce Arians and what he continues to do when he it comes to whether it's Andrew Luck in Indianapolis, whether it's Arizona, uh, or, or, or here in Tampa Bay last year in his first first season. But here we are. You have a huge addition. His name's Tom Brady. You have another one at tight end, Rob Gronkowski. Say goodbye to Jameis. Say goodbye to Peyton Barber. And um, spend a first-round draft pick on Tristan Wirfs, offensive lineman, trying to protect Tom Brady. Donovan Smith's one of the two players that have come out and said they are considering. He's the offensive tackle in Tampa. And tackle. he's He's considering uh, skipping the year that he'll be a name to watch. But they also added Keyshawn Vaughn in the third round running back to accompany uh, Jason's my guy. Don't do that. <laughs> Ronald Jones. No, don't. You, you can't, can't, assign, can't assign that. I am warming now, on Ronald Jones. Let but, me just uh, ask you a question. Would you put the hate blockers on when you announce it? 
Would that be? Oh, I would have to. I would have to. I'm I'm (laughs) legally obligated if that happened. I don't. I so here's you know here's why he's not going to be a a my guy. But he he I like him for fantasy this year where he's being drafted. uh, Ronald Jones is as a complete backup, um, and he's a starter. And my worry though is he did he did have um you know some pass protection issues last year. That's a huge thing for. Bruce Arians it's even bigger now with Tom Brady now is that to say that a rookie coming in is going to be better at it than you know two years of on-field experience no but should Ronald Jones come out and whiff a couple times and get Tom Brady sacked he will be yanked so you know I'm I I I wouldn't be able to make Ronald Jones a my guy but I do think he is a value right now in drafts especially if you're like a zero RB drafter and you're Drafting your running backs late, he's a starter that's going super late for an offense that's good. It is a, a testament to your analysis that you have pivoted your willingness to take Ronald Jones. And I, I'm just saying this is like introspection moment here. Like we spend all of our time on this show telling our listenership to stay water, pay attention to what's happening, pay attention to draft price. Mm. But it is so entertaining to bring bring up over and over again. Yeah, I hate it, but I love it. <laughs> I hate it, but I love it. And it sucks because Keyshawn, Keyshawn Vaughn was a guy that both Mike and myself. Yeah, I don't I don't know how you felt, Andy, but I know we had conversations yeah, you pre the NFL draft. We adore him. That was one of the guys before the draft that I had. I had him ranked. I think he was my number four running back pre draft. And my only thing was I didn't think someone was going to take him high enough to matter. And and he was. He was drafted with good enough capital here by the Buccaneers to maybe get a shot at relevance. But right now, you think that Ronald Jones will have more fantasy worthy weeks than Keyshawn Vaughn in this upcoming twenty twenty season? I do, Mike. Yes, I do as well. All right, let's talk about. Uh, by the way, Ronald Jones going at RB32 right now. So, um, yeah, that, that that could be a great opportunity in a Brady offense if he gets it, which we expect. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, one of the best I tandems like in both. football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Not a lot to say about these guys. No. Well, I guess we need to talk about Mike Evans because well, Jason, just- Jason has him ranked the lowest. Like, I'm – I'm in. I'm. I'm in with Tom Brady. I'm in with the Plant Man. I think him with in the Bruce Arian system. There's going to be fantasy points flowing throughout the team. Jason, you're a bit more skeptical that Mike Evans, Mister. I have not had fewer than a thousand yards in my entire career. I, you have him uh, not I performing am, as well. I am not skeptical in the slightest. Uh, what, where I've got him ranked right now is disgusting at wide receiver 19. That's just how the stats fell when it comes to not only Mike Evans, but the other 18 wide receivers who have statted out ahead. I I would have zero qualms being at a draft, looking, staring down Mike Evans, even as my wide receiver one, and saying he has every tool capable to be great this season. I think, you know, because of the Bruce Arians system, the, the utilization of the slot, and Tom Brady's propensity to utilize a slot wide receiver in Julian Edelman or Wes Welker, Chris Godwin has the probability of being the clear number one in this offense. But it's not a foregone conclusion that Mike Evans, who's just a beast of a wide receiver, always had a thousand yards, is great. Now as a quarterback, hopefully upgrade, um, going to Tom Brady could have a wonderful season. I'm not, I'm not anti Mike Evans in the slightest, okay. but the fact that there are those two great wide receivers, that's why. You look at rankings and you say, well, what, you know, some people might say we're anti-Gronk. Gronk used to be the... I'm, I'm pretty anti-Gronk. He used to be the, the number one or the one B on the offense. He is, at best, the distant third in an offense, now splitting with another tight end. So, um, yeah, I'm, I have no qualms with Chris Godwin well, or there, Mike Evans. There is the aspect of we'll find out to this offense in terms of the receiving targets. We don't know who yes. Tom Brady's going to prefer. We don't know how much the system will look like last year's. And I don't, I maybe you guys can remember off the top of your head, I don't remember the last down the field Patriot wide receiver under Brady that had a monster fantasy. Randy season. Moss. <laughs> so, who comes I, Brandon Cooks. I mean, Brandon oh, Cooks that's did true. pretty well. That's true. 
So it's it's been a little bit of a while uh, since that happened. That does not to take anything away from Mike Evans, but when you talk about Chris Godwin, all of us have him. Well, no, Mike doesn't, but Jason and I have him ranked outside of where he's being drafted. He's the wide receiver six. It's really a ceiling pick with Chris Godwin right now in fantasy drafts, whereas Evans, the value on him seems... Uh, yeah, I mean, for both guys, it's really a ceiling <laughs> pick. I mean, they're both in the top 10. So. Of, of average draft, yeah. And and here are some worries. You brought it up earlier. Donovan Smith, the left tackle, um, and Tristan Wirfs, a rookie. Uh, that is a very difficult position to have no preseason, uh, uh, no OTAs, uh, truncated. You know, they're going to be out there being like, what's the snap count? Um, so if, if he's missing those two pieces or – if Tristan Wirfs takes a while as a rookie to be good and this offensive line isn't what you hope it is, then – and Brady is no spring chicken. It could get – it could get ugly. I trust Brady as the GOAT to yell at his offensive line and coach him up enough, but it's uh, it's not without risk. This isn't a guarantee that Chris Godwin is great and Mike Evans is 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 great. This was a good offensive line last season ranked 7th by uh, Pro Football Focus. They're ranked 13th going into the season. They did draft Tristan Wirfs. There are some question marks. Obviously, Brady can't move around, but he's going to have a lot of targets. I am the highest on Rob Gronkowski of the three of us. It has inched forward in recent weeks. You you talked about Jared Cook earlier in the show about, you know, once you get beyond the first two or three tight ends, the volume type of players. Sure. You're looking at touchdowns and probability of touchdowns, and Gronkowski has that a a capability. And uh, you know, three weeks into the season, everybody could be staring at Rob Gronkowski, who's got five touchdowns on the season, and going, "Well, I missed that." So I just think that that's a possibility, and I like the upside, and I can see the path. But he's not the same Gronk, and people need to remember that. Yep, agreed. Yeah, he hasn't played a full season since 2011. (laughs) That's That's well, quite a while. It, is there? I mean, there's got to be a few 15 game seasons where he. Just I'm didn't sure there play are. It's the just a week. stat I like. It's just a hot stat. For, <laughs> that was like probably when Randy Moss was still playing. Yeah. Um, the Carolina Panthers at five and eleven last year. They will round out this divisional breakdown, and they bring in a brand new quarterback. Goodbye, Cam Newton. Hello, Teddy Bridgewater, who was. You know, very admirable in his filling in for Drew Brees last year. Mm-hmm. The Cam Newton and Greg Olson, that tandem is, they're both gone. Robbie Anderson comes in from years and years of disappointing us, uh, potential versus output in yeah. in New York. And you get a new head coach. I mean, there's just a lot of change here. Uh, Matt Rule, Matt Ja Rule. <sighs> yes. Murder. I mean, he's, he's coming off of, Really I successful see zero, college career. Yeah, with zero counts of murder, by the way, on his <laughs> criminal record. Replacing Ron Rivera, great head coach at Baylor, uh, bringing in a new system, which, I mean, it's it's interesting because when you look at what the landscape is for this offseason, you know, Jason just talked about it. It's a very truncated time period. You don't even get to go out and like, I remember last season when Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona came out in the preseason. It was like he showed a little bit, but not a lot, and he tried to work some systems right. in, and it still took the team. I mean, look at Arizona as the template here. You know, it took the team a while to figure out that system and get to where they were changing those offensive numbers and running more plays. And so it, it concerns me from a predictability standpoint for Carolina to be in the division that they're in. I think we would all agree that you know the other. I mean, do you have them at the bottom? Oh, yeah. Or do you have Atlanta at the bottom? I mean, it, I think they're at the bottom. I, I have Carolina Tough division. at the bottom. They, their def, no defense has more turnover than the Panthers. They literally drafted their defense this year. Their entire draft was on the defensive side of the ball. Um, I love that they project to have a poor defense. And and when you look at Matt Rule, he's he has turned – Two different college yes. programs completely around from losers to absolute winners, but both 
programs, the first year that he was there, they stunk. It took him two years to turn him around, and they gave him a long-term contract. They're talking about building this the right way. They drafted a whole bunch of defensive guys. I think they're worried about getting the offensive continuity. For fantasy, I actually – this is like the – my – the team I'm most excited about that I think is also going to be terrible in the NFL yeah. that I can remember because you have Joe Brady, who was the, you know, the, the offensive coordinator for LSU last year. But prior to that, he was working with the Saints for a couple of years with Sean Payton. And he was there when Teddy Bridgewater was there. That's not a coincidence why Bridgewater is here. So there is a little bit of at least experience in working together. Um, and I'm sure some of the same systems will be implemented. And, you know, when you look at having not a great offensive line and a terrible defense and a, a really accurate short throwing quarterback, I love Christian McCaffrey. I love DJ Moore. Um, those pieces I, I want on my fantasy teams. I didn't want to interrupt you in the middle of that because you bring up some very good points. But I'm going to interrupt we this also conversation listening right now. Because we were waiting for this. Breaking news. The NFLPA player reps approved the NFL's proposal on their conference call. The deal is done. Let's play some football. Oh, Let's go, man. Are you ready for some football? Let's go. <laughs> that is uh, Ian Rappaport, by the way, reporting. That is, that is great news. I have a smile uh, on my face. Yes. I, uh, I agreed with all the parts of what you were saying about them struggling. <laughs> I didn't agree with the fact I don't like crafting the narrative around, you know, this is Teddy Bridgewater's first team. I don't it's not it, his first team. This is, he, he, he no, this is just twenty two and twelve, man. Okay. All right. This is okay. This would be the first time that he was fantasy relevant based on all of these things that you're painting. If you tell me Sam Bradford is on a team with a really bad defense and a bad offensive line, I'm not excited. If you tell me Alex Smith's on a team with a bad defense and a bad offensive line, I'm not excited. I need to see it first. He, this is a prove it to me policy right. with Teddy Bridgewater. You give me a bunch of short throws and sacks. I'm not that excited with Teddy Bridgewater. That's my concern. Uh, I know you love DJ Moore. He'll be heavily targeted. No reason not to. Mm -hmm. Christian McCaffrey. I don't care what narrative you can create. You have to draft him first in fantasy leagues. Those two players. You know, I think you guys have really made your case for DJ Moore. I've watched the film. He's going to be best friends with Teddy Bridgewater. They're going yes, to be is. skipping down the yellow brick road together. Yes. But beyond that, and with Teddy Bridgewater in particular, I have my question marks. I'll just leave it at that. And then, you know, Mike, I don't I don't know what stands out to you on this team. If you have any bold predictions for Carolina. Well, I had, you know, I had a couple things when I was researching, you know, Teddy Bridgewater uh, that stood out is was interesting to me. So last year, Teddy Bridgewater in his stint as the Saints starter just over 7% of his attempts were deep passes, but he had a 57% adjusted uh, completion percentage. Very, he, he was good. When he went deep, it was good. You know that last year, Drew Brees only went deep 8.2% of the time? Like, so, and, and I bring that up as, yes, we have a, a, a larger sample of Teddy Bridgewater not going deep, but perhaps that was just, that was the philosophy of the offense last year for the Saints. Neither of the starting quarterbacks were really going deep uh, at, a, at a huge clip. Meanwhile, we've we've had Matt Rule talk about the deep pass is going to be a larger part of this offense. We have again, if you want to go with the, the I have to see it first. I'm just projecting of what this team could possibly be. And uh, one other name I want to bring up: Post type it, Sleeperville. Yeah. Well, no. Actually, not Curtis Samuel. No. Oh, okay. I want, okay. I want to bring Ian up Thomas. Ian Thomas, the starting tight end now for the Carolina Panthers, who uh, he's averaged six targets a game in games where Greg Olson has not been there. Hot stat from the Saints. Uh, Jared Cook was active for four starts with Teddy Bridgewater. Jared Cook was a top six tight end in two of those four games. So it it's not impossible that Teddy Bridgewater finds himself another friend and Ian Thomas, I, th I think we need to bring him up as a one of those late round flyers where you just you if you punt the position, maybe you take a shot for I, Ian Thomas. I put him right with you know Jonu Smith, Jonu Smith and Ian Thomas are in very similar situations. The the veterans leaving and can they step up and and fill that void? Yeah, Carolina is just uh, one of those teams that between the di difficulty of the division, 
not seeing what Matt Rule is going to bring to the table. You talked about Teddy Bridgewater's sample size. I will call that Teddy Bridgewater's career thus far. Um, for me, it's a prove-it thing. I do love the... I mean, he's got weapons on paper that should be able yes. to equip him for fantasy production. So maybe these are some guys that you're targeting even if they struggle a little bit with, you know, on the road against Tampa, on the road against the Chargers, facing Arizona. You go out of the gate, you're learning a system, you're play, playing some difficult teams. Maybe you project some of these guys to get it together in the second half. And you yeah. have, you're going from Kyle Allen, who was ranked 35th in passer rating last year, to Teddy Bridgewater, who was 11th. It wasn't a full season, but he is much better. He is a much better quarterback than Kyle Allen. Yeah, and I think that's a good note to end on because I have no lack of respect for Teddy Bridgewater and his ability to run an offense. I mean, he did that competently in Minnesota. He just did it in a way that wasn't, at, at that time, you know, that wasn't going to help your fantasy team. Right. But he's got everybody around him to do it. Curtis Samuel was one of the strangest situations last year. <laughs> this is, the, the Curtis Samuel got Kyle Allen. Big time, man. Yeah, Big that's time. a good way to put it. I mean, he led the NFL in routes run. He was on the field constantly. 67 of 107 targets were catchable. That's ridiculous. You can't hold that against Curtis Samuel at all. That's so no. Because I have never caught any passes uh, that were not <laughs> that were catchable. Uncatchable. Yeah. It, so the, the nice thing is with Robbie Anderson coming in, while Curtis Samuel can be a deep threat, and obviously was thrown to a lot deep last year, I don't think he's going to be pigeonholed into being a, you know, run run deep every single time. I, I think they'll use him in the intermediate routes. I think he can excel there too. But the only guy I'm confident in is DJ Moore. So I love DJ Moore. I love CMC. And then I'm just going to take a wait and see approach with the rest of the offense. When I see 40 targets that were uncatchable, it makes me wonder how many other targets didn't even get counted as targets for him. <laughs> they were just so outside the bounds that they counted as targets for other people. They didn't know Wait, who it was to. Hold on. Was, mean, that a, was that a target or did he throw the ball away? Yeah, who was that one to? I don't know. But uh, yeah, guys, we're going to have football. Whew. We're going to have football in 2020. It's been Heck a wild is. a wild road. But uh, hey, get get ready to go. I mean, this past week, with all this news breaking, we set our... We set our draft date in League of Record, and we mm -hmm. and we made our rules adjustments, and we did a lot of that stuff that maybe we would have done just a little bit earlier, but just like you guys out there, maybe you were waiting to just kind of have that jolt of energy for the NFL season, and it's here, and we're going to have football, and it might not look exactly like it did in years past, but we're going to have it, and, and having mm -hmm. watched some baseball yesterday, just live sports, man, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Absolutely. I have two quick notes before we get out of here. Like it's almost the end of the month. Footclanvote.com. We are up for the podcast awards. If you could just take a second, go over there, nominate us for the people's choice and for sports, and you know, throw spitballers in there for best comedy. Make sure you check the box that you says You could even you could even listen to spitballers too. I well, mean, if, I'm if you just, wanted I'm, to. I'm I'm just assuming that people do. Like, <laughs> and make sure you check the box that says you would like to vote. And hopefully you'll be able to, to to vote and lock that up for the fantasy footballers and the spitballers. And two, you, you want to talk about hype for football. Follow our social media accounts on Twitter at the FF Ballers, on Instagram at Fantasy Footballers. We got some stuff planned for next week, and you will not want to miss notifications. So make sure you are following us. That is a spectacular reminder, Mike. Well done. Thank you. We're going to go live a bunch next week. That's what he's trying to – it was a secret. Look, there's – and we got a lot of Todd Gurley or David Montgomery coming up. Oh, my oh, gosh. No. Is that a weekly event? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Foot Clan, a reminder, WGU has created an online university for people whose ambition never rests. WGU's competency-based learning model is designed specifically to fit in the lives of busy adults. They offer online bachelor's and master's degrees, business IT and education and nursing. And uh, it's about half the cost of other online universities. You can get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash fantasy footballers. That's wgu.edu slash fantasy footballers.